Olá, boa tarde. Bem-vindos todos novamente à primeira semana de física, de encontro de física aqui no Maranhão. Bem, a gente vai ter agora uma, uma palestra final aqui do evento. Sei que não vai ser uma palestra muito de divulgação, ela é uma palestra um tanto mais específica, sobre um tema específico, mas eu já tive a oportunidade de falar um de interagir com esse pesquisador, ele é uma pessoa muito solista, é uma verdade, então agora a gente vai conversar um pouco, obviamente que vai ser em inglês, sim, eu peço que se vocês tiverem algum questionamento, mesmo que seja em português, vocês podem fazer, a gente traduz aqui para ele, mas no geral ele vai falar sobre a era inflacionária, ele é especialista sobre esse tema, e a gente pretende dar uma contribuição para que vocês possam, no sentido de vocês interagindo com esse tipo de assunto. É interessante estudar essas, essas diversidades que existem por aí. So, thank you, my dad. Thank you for accepting our invitation for the, this, this event. It's a very pleasure for us to have you here. So, in nowadays, works in the CTP, is it right? And the yeah. Stanford Institute of Theoretical Physics, he has an expertise on inflation cosmology. So in name of the organization of the event, we welcome you. And we will probably know that it will be very great to, to know what you research nowadays and you can pitch to us about inflation. So thank you. Take your time. Okay. Thank you, Fernando, for the invitation. I'm very happy uh, to be part of this uh, meeting or oh, what happened. Uh, it's, it's okay. The presentation will start in a second. Somehow my, no, my computer, I think, uh, is... Uh, the, the, you can reopen the, the presentation again. It's probably work. Okay, I try. Um. Yes, I th I think that my my computer is crashing. Uh, I might need to restart. No problem at all. We, we will wait to restart the, the because this application is not responding so i might need to restart sorry no problem it works at the at this time all the technical errors are common okay then i restart so see you in a couple of minutes okay during this time you can talking a little bit about your work and okay. about Talk about the audience. What will be discussed here? Ok. Então, como eu já... Sim. Como a gente vai aguardar um pouco o computador reiniciar, o que o professor vai apresentar, o tema da apresentação dele é sobre The Sitter. Assim, não sei se todos vocês conhecem, mas na linguagem da relatividade geral, o espaço de The Sitter... Ele é uma solução simétrica da solução de vácuo da energia do, da, da equação de Einstein. E ela está presente justamente desde a deformação do espaço-tempo até chegar no desacoplamento, que é a, a gente conhece como a inflação. Então, o que ele vai apresentar para a gente, se eu não estou enganado, é um dos últimos trabalhos que ele vem pesquisando sobre soluções dessa natureza para descrever a inflação. Então, ele provavelmente vai falar um pouco sobre soluções do tipo de Sitter, anti de Sitter, nesses dois espaços. E esse nome de Sitter advém de um pesquisador, de um astrônomo holandês, né? Trabalhou um pouco com Einstein, ele, nas, nas soluções iniciais, quando você começou a estabelecer relações entre cosmologia e teoria da relatividade geral. Então, ali, sim, algumas soluções, as soluções de de Sitter, de Sitter Einstein foram muito presentes. Então, eu creio que seja esse trabalho que ele vai, vai falar. Obviamente que foge muitas vezes o interesse, porque é um tanto técnico, 
mas não menos interessante como os outros trabalhos que foram apresentados. Então, eu creio que nesse sentido vai dar, vai dar para a gente ter uma visão geral do que ele está apresentando. Lucas, quando tiver alguma novidade aí, tu me avisa. Sim, o que nós temos também para falar e que sempre a gente recomenda é que vocês acompanham sempre esse canal. Esse canal aqui foi gentilmente cedido pelo Lucas, porque a gente sofreu uma certa contratempo no nosso canal. Então, o Lucas aproveitou e gentilmente nos disponibilizou o canal. E aí a gente conseguiu fazer a transmissão toda por cá. Obviamente também tem aquelas redes sociais que o Eduardo sempre menciona, eu que não tenho memória muito boa para gravar, mas eu creio que depois o Lucas, que é quem sempre ajuda a gente, que é... It's again? It's, it's working now? Uh, yes, it seems, seems so. Can you see my screen? Ok, now it's perfect. Great. So now we can start. The presentation title is Up Tunneling to the Deceiter. So take your time. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation um, to talk about cosmology in this meeting. Uh, so the modern cosmology uh that i want to talk about it has started its life about a hundred years ago with the discovery of the expansion of the universe uh, and ever since uh one of the central questions of cosmology has been uh asking uh about the history of the universe and under understanding what happened before and pushing this question as far back as we can to understand what happened at earlier and earlier times. And we have made a lot of progress uh, on this question, on understanding the history of our universe and the origin. Uh, for instance, we have understood a lot about uh, the structure formation, the thermal history, uh, the uh, cosmic microwave background. We can draw nice pictures like this, and we have a quantitative understanding of many, many epochs that have, uh, that uh, exist in this picture. Uh, we have a good quantitative understanding of uh, the expansion of the universe over many uh, orders of magnitude. And of course, there are also many uh, pauses and uh, questions that remain unknown and unanswered. For instance, we, we would like to understand the nature of dark matter. There are uh, more theoretical or conceptual pauses like the cosmological constant problem and so on. But uh, we can say that we have uh, we, we we have an overall uh, overall understanding of what happened uh, in cosmology uh, after the after the thermal period, and we also have a very compelling theory for the initial condition for what happened at the uh, before this thermal uh, uh, thermal epoch. And that is called the theory of inflation. Uh, so what is inflation? Inflation was a theory that is supposed to give us an initial condition for uh, what happens in the, uh, for what happens in the universe that we are observing. So it's a theory of initial condition. And it was uh, invented as a result of uh, physicists and uh, theoretical cosmologists not to be content with a, a Big Bang theory, which was extremely fine-tuned. So they were rejecting this, and inf inflation was uh, uh, was proposed as as the alternative to this uh, hot Big Bang theory. So what is the what is the problem with hot Big Bang theory? I give one uh, one of them. One of the problems or uh, 
uh, one of the main problems, which is called the horizon problem. So what is the horizon problem? Uh, in the, if we draw a space-time diagram for our universe, for the cosmology, then um, uh, we can choose a time parameter, which is here, I'm, I'm calling it eta, it's got the conformal time. And uh, in this hot Big Bang theory, this conformal time uh, this starts from zero. So at zero, there will be a hot Big Bang. So that is this black line. Probably I should have drawn it red instead of black. But this black, black line would be the beginning of time in the hot Big Bang cosmology. There will be a singularity here. Uh, and then everything starts from there and cools down until re it reaches us today. The observer O, who is uh, who is sitting here and is observing, uh, for instance, photons that are coming from the last scattering surface. So this red line is supposed to be the last scattering surface. And what we see as observers in this universe is that the this the universe at large at large distances at cosmological distances is extremely uh, uh, uniform extremely homogeneous and isotropic and this was a puzzle why because we see points uh, on the sky which have never been in causal contact with each other they have never talk to each other. So for instance, we see uh, photons coming from the last scattering surface, the CMB photons, and these photons have uh, all more or less the same temperature. They have the same temperature to within one to uh, 10 to the five uh, precision. Uh, and this is a puzzle because these two points, for instance, in this picture, they have never been in causal contact with each other. They, if you uh, consider the past of the, these two, two points on the two sides of uh, this picture, they would, uh, they would hit the singularity before, uh, before, hit, uh, before getting connected to each other. So that was the horizon problem. The, the question was, how, how can different points which uh, are out of horizon, so this fact that they have not been in causal contact, we call it uh, to be out of the horizon from each other. These two points that are, uh, uh, are not in, in their own horizon, how could they, how could they have such similar temperatures? But this required a very large fine tuning at the level of the initial condition that we impose uh, here. And inflation is the is a way to solve this problem. And the way it solves it is that it says that actually there is no singularity here at this uh, at this black line. The time continues backward or the, the diagram continues backward. And before that hot phase, there was a period of accelerated expansion that we call it inflation. And that hot, that the thing that we used to call hot Big Bang is just the end of inflation, which is called reheating. Now, why, why does it solve the problem? Is because if this diagram is continued backward, then these two points that we thought they were not in causal contact, they actually come in causal contact with each other. They come in causal contact during inflation. Uh, so inflation, it, it is uh, a, a, the space time which is uh, which has accelerated expansion. It has a metric which is as close to that, approximated by that. This is the De Sitter metric uh, in some particular coordinate system. If we take H to be constant. Now, during inflation, we don't think H is constant. It can be changing slowly, but uh, it is approximately like this. And as you see, there is a, uh, there is an exponential expansion uh, in this um, in this uh, space time. Uh, so here I'm drawing a space 
este space time diagram a cartoon of a space time diagram of the theater space uh, for now let's just focus on the black part i will talk about the red part later so what it does is that this accelerated expansion um this stretches exponentially a very small region into a, a, into such an enormous uh, region of a space that could include all of what we see today so therefore everything that we see and it looks homogeneous and isotropy that could come from a tiny a small region at the beginning of inflation. That's how this uh, horizon problem is resolved by, uh, by inflation. Uh, in addition, inflation has, an, has a nice uh, mechanism for producing small fluctuations on top of this homogeneous and uniform picture, which we actually we, we also see today like CMB on isotropies these the small fluctuations of order ten, of uh, uh, of order, fluctuations of order ten to the minus five which become the seeds for the structures and galaxies that form later in the universe. Um, so this is the this was uh, this was the proposal. And the proposal that we have uh, 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 some observation or evidence for it based based on the CMB and the structure formation data. Uh, but how does it work? The underlying physics uh, for inflation is is very simple actually. So. So in cosmology, we are. If we talk about the background evolution, we uh, we are solving the Friedman equation, which is this equation. The Hubble h is the Hubble rate, the expansion rate of the universe, and rho is the uh, the energy density. Here I'm considering a spatially flat cosmology. So this equation is relatively simple. And what we need for accelerated expansion is that the energy density rho it shouldn't change significantly with time. Or in other words, the ratio of rho dot over h rho it has to be much less than one. Uh, if we take the extreme limit of rho dot equal to zero, that would be uh, what we have when we are in a vacuum energy dominated cosmology. And that would give us a, a, the exact the Sitter space time. When it is a small, but they not exactly zero, then it, we will call it quasi the Sitter, not exact the Sitter, but it is still inflate. So let us consider the simplest case when rho dot is equal to zero, we have just vacuum energy which is constant. And that can be realized if, for instance, if we have a scalar field uh, with a potential that looks like this. And if the field is stuck in this false minimum uh, with positive vacuum energy, with positive uh, V of phi at the bottom, then in this situation, what we get is, a, uh, what we get is a, uh, the Sitter solution, the De Sitter space time, uh, which, for instance, we can tunnel out of it via quantum mechanical tunneling, and then go to to a lower vacuum. So that could be the end of inflation or reheat. In fact, this was uh, this this is called false vacuum inflation. That was one of the earliest proposals and to realize inflation by Alan Goose. Uh, however, this simple model does, is not phenomenologically viable. So the more, uh, more uh, uh, working version uh, of the inflating scenario would uh, look more like this, a potential uh, that smoothly goes down to zero and then we have a field that is at the top of the potential and it is slowly rolls down 
And the solution that we get in this case is called the slow roll inflation. And this is slow roll inflation, as I mentioned, it's a, it's a nice theory of the initial condition for the subse subsequent uh, evolution of the universe. Uh, it gives us a, it gives us a spectrum of, in addition to solving the the old problems like the uh, horizon problem that I mentioned and some other problems like flatness problem, it also gives us a spectrum of fluctuations uh, which are nearly Gaussian and nearly scale invariant, and that is very uh, close to, or that is. Uh, well, of course, there are uh, there are model dependence, but uh, what we see can be exactly matched with the theory of inflation. We can exactly reproduce what we observe at the level of fluctuation, CMB fluctuations by uh, by a model in inflation. Uh, so it is a, it is a successful model for the initial condition. Uh, of the subsequent era, however, by itself is not a, a full theory of initial condition because inflation itself is uh, is not past complete. It is not eternal to the past, meaning that there will be there has to be a singularity to the past of inflation in a similar way that there is a singularity in the old hot big bang cosmology uh, so therefore inflation itself also needs a theory of initial condition maybe the the situation is uh, much uh, uh, there is a milder problem compared to the situation with the hot big bang because inflation tends to erase the uh, uh, information about initial data once it uh, starts, uh, but uh, still it is uh, it is a it is a question of what what gave this uh, initial condition. What was the origin of inflation? And the conventional wisdom is that that origin, uh, uh, if we go past, we get to singularity, and that origin has to do with full fledged quantum gravity. The, we have to go to a scale at which the, the space time doesn't make much sense anymore. And uh, before understanding uh, quantum gravity in all details, we wouldn't be able to give a full description of the initial condition for inflation. Uh, however, we can we can also wonder about an alternative scenario, which is that maybe in the same way that inflation was a simple uh, semi-classical description for the initial condition of the hot big bang phase, maybe there is a similar uh, semi-classical theory for the, for the origin of inflation, for the initial condition of inflation. And in fact, this question was, asked a long time ago, um, and not, not long after inflation itself was, uh, was invented. Uh, so what is the uh, one, uh, there are several proposals for this semi-classical theory of initial condition. And by, when I say semi-classical, what I mean is that we, we are looking for some description of the initial condition or some theory for the initial condition for which the, the notion of a space-time is still meaningful. So we can still do a quantum field theory on a curved background rather than dealing with a situation in which the notion of a space-time is, uh, is not uh, very well defined. So uh, thus, there are several proposals by, by Hart and Hawking, by Willenkin, by Linde, uh, and so on. 
So one of the simplest ones is the what is called a no boundary proposal about hard time hawking, which is that the initial condition for inflation is set uh, or determined by uh, by this simple criterion that we want to cap off the geometry uh, so that it has no other boundary or actually no boundary because here this one is not the boundary it's just continuous forward in time uh, now this picture that i have drawn is a weird picture in the sense that this picture is half Lorentzian and half euclidean if the right half of this diagram is a Lorentzian diagram when time goes to, from left to right. While, while the left side, this red part, is the Euclidean manifold. And uh, it's easy to understand why, why the, it's, uh, we have such a mix. The reason is that we cannot have a, if we have a uh, in the, in Lorentzian space time, we cannot just end the manifold. The time-like trajectories cannot just bend around in a Lorentzian uh, manifold. Uh, so that's why it, uh, at some point there will be a rotation or connection to Euclidean manifold that around that allows this uh, this space time to to end without having a bound and uh, and this is uh, at least as, as you can see from the picture it seems like a very simple proposal and it uh, has uh, it has suc it successfully uh, predicts the initial condition for the fluctuations during inflation it gives a uh, a reasonable wave function for the fluctuation that would agree with with observations. So in that sense, it is phenomenologically uh, adequate. On the other hand, when when if if we ask this uh, theory about the the overall scale of inflation, then it gives a bad prediction because. Uh, the probability that gives for the scalar field, if we have a, the scalar field with some potential V of phi, it goes as e to the uh, one over V of phi with some numerical constant. And what it means is that it ex it exponentially prefers uh, the points of the potential with the smaller uh, the points of the potential with the small value of V. So if you imagine, for instance, this is my scalar field potential, this probability that we get from the hart hawking proposal would be peaked at the bottom of this potential. But as we saw before, in order to have inflation or some long period of inflation, we need the field to be a, at some higher point of the potential, like here, and roll down. So this proposal is not very successful at, at predicting that. Uh, so now we can ask, can there be other, other scenarios, other semi-classical scenarios for the, for the initial condition of inflation, for the origin of inflation? And this is related to the, uh, to the subject of this talk. This, uh, we want to ask the, about the following possibility: Could could the could inflation start from uh, what I call optonally from a lower vacuum to a higher vacuum and then rolling down? So therefore, the question would be: Could there be eternal Minkowski space time before inflation? Uh, Okay, so so that is that was the motivation for what the question that I'm asking. But now uh, we can simplify the question. So now I'm going to consider just the potential with two minima. If we understand whether it is possible or not uh, tunneling, or if we learn that it is possible to up tunnel from this minimum to that minimum. 
and get, for instance, what is uh, what is got eternal inflation, false vacuum eternal inflation, then it would it would be easy to modify this potential to the one I have before. So the the conceptual question can also be asked in here in this simpler setup. In which case, we are basically up tunneling to a geometry that is the sitter, exact the sitter, uh, apart from the quantum mechanical tunneling. Uh, so this is the this is the setup that we want to consider. We want to consider potential with two minima. One of them is at zero. So there is zero vacuum energy, and therefore Minkowski and the we want to ask, can we go up? Uh, so first of all, we we ask this question in the absence of gra gravity. If we imagine we turn off gravity, or if we imagine we are considering the scales which are microscopic at which gravity is not relevant. So just in quantum field theory, can we have such a process going up? Of course, uh, there is energy conservation. Uh, in quantum field theory, and we cannot just go up from the from the lower vacuum to a higher vacuum. However, if we have some energy in here, say for instance, we we consider some scattering process, and we collide things together. If we spend enough energy, then uh, we can always produce. We can always kick ourselves or something. Uh, up the barrier or a light to tunnel through the barrier to go to the false vacuum. Uh, as, a, as a proof of principle, let's consider this setup. Let's start from some initial condition that is part that is asymptotic in the true vacuum, but it has some region in the false vacuum. So this is what I'm drawing here. Sometimes it's called a king contact king configuration. So this region is in the false vacuum. What happens is that quantum mechanically, uh, this false vacuum is unstable, so it will decay. Therefore, this uh, initial configuration eventually decays into uh, into fluctuations in the true vacuum. Now, if we apply time reversal to this picture, what it gives us is some scattering process of fluctuations in the true vacuum that produce a region of the false vacuum. And we can make this region as big as we want. Uh, but of course, we want to have gravity. That was the whole point. Uh, because in the presence of gravity, there is a qualitative difference. If we make a big uh, bubble of false vacuum, then it will change the asymptotic structure of the space time because it inflates. So it doesn't necessarily uh, decay back to the original vacuum. It will create, a, it can create a new universe and it starts uh, its own life and its own cosmology. And that's exactly what we were asking. Could we start from Minkowski and create this inflating bubble that will lead to a new, new cosmology and new thermal history and everything? Uh, so this is, some, this is a Penrose diagram for the future, uh, for the future of such a scenario. Uh, which consider in some other setup by this uh, by these authors, it, they they consider the situation in which this arises from inflation. So the initial condition for them is different compared to what uh, we are asking here. Uh, but the the asymptotic structure is the same. So we want to consider a situation in which we have asymptotic Minkowski. And then it is connected to asymptotic the city and inflating reach. And this situation, uh, indeed, it cannot happen classically. Uh, uh, if we impose some uh, uh, 
uh, reasonable conditions on the energy momentum tensor or on the matter content of the theory, which is called null energy condition. The Penrose singularity theorem would say that if we have this inflating bubble, there has to be a singularity to its past. So it couldn't come from in, uh, just a Minkowski space. So classically, it is not possible. But we can ask whether it can happen quantum mechanically via uh, quantum mechanical tunneling. Uh, well, and we know that there are many processes that are forbidden classically, but they can happen quantum mechanically. And this question was indeed asked uh, about 30 years ago by Farhi Gust and Guven by Fischler, Morgan, and Polchinski. And uh, so basically, they are asking essentially the same question can we create a universe in the lab by quantum tunneling? And the scenario that uh, they considered was the tunneling between a solution that contains a small bubble of false vacuum that is not large enough to inflate. So that bubble will collapse. Uh, and the scenario that they considered was whether it is pos possible to tunnel from this uh, configuration. This is a space like a slice of the initial geometry. And then the question is, can, can we tunnel from this space, uh, spatial slice to this one, in which the tunnel is big enough to, to inflate? Um, so what did they find? They actually proposed to define the tunneling solution. Uh, so here I'm drawing the, the Penrose diagrams for those two. Uh, situation. So the, the 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 plus that I was drawing before could be thought of as the slices through this geometry, the first one, and the second one is sliced through this geometry. And the idea is to tunnel from this to that. And as you see, the second picture, the final picture, if it is extended backward in time, it has a singularity to its past. So it satisfies sing Penrose singularity theorem, but the trick is that this one was actually produced from tunneling of some other geometry. It wasn't like this as you go back. Uh, it, it, this diagram has to be actually cut from the middle and glued back to the future of this. Uh, so there is this uh, there is this proposal. Uh, however, the, the, there is a there there is a singularity in this uh, solution, and it's not it's not clear, or in this uh, tunneling solution that is found, uh, it's not uh, clear whether this is an acceptable acceptable solution. Uh, if if one one should allow this tunneling in the quantum gravity in the gravitational path integrals, and there is there has been works on this uh, since thirty years ago, including two recent works uh, that I, that appeared last year, and these are two papers that have. Uh, the opposing view on this question. One of them argues that this should not be allowed. This is not a admit admissible uh, tunneling, and the other one argues that it is uh, it is accepted. Uh, but since uh, it, it, that the question doesn't seem to be settled, it seems that it would be useful to have an alternative solution if we want to answer the question positive. And the goal here is to propose, uh, propose one alternative. So this alternative that I'm going to propose here is 
uh, is a solution that is found in the near extremal uh, black hole geometries. So I'm using some simplifications that happen in the near extremal black hole geometries. And these are uh, simplifications and it's based on works that have been uh, have been going on recently. There has been uh, lots of activity on this near horizon uh, geometry of near extremal black holes. This is some of the authors who have worked on this. So the idea is to consider the spherically symmetric black hole solutions uh, with this general form of the metric. And we consider the false vacuum and the true vacuum. So in the true vacuum, in the Minkowski vacuum, uh, we consider a charged black hole, a reisner nordstrom black hole, where f of r is given by this function of r. Um, and and it is a black hole, it has horizons which correspond to the zeros of this f of r. There are two zeros which correspond to the two horizons, the outer horizon and the inner horizon of this rational Nordstrom geometry. So here I'm drawing the Penrose diagram for this geometry. And we want to consider a situation in which the two sides, the two asymptotic regions of this geometry are identified with each other. So we have a wormhole geometry. And in the false vacuum, what we consider is a Schwarzschild de Sitter uh, space time. Again, this F has uh, multiple zeros. The two positive zeros corresponds to the position of two horizons. So there is a black hole horizon here, and then there is a cosmological horizon. Now, what happens when we uh, go near extremity? What is extremity is when the two zeros of these functions approach each other. So we can tune these mass parameters here so that the these two values at which there are zeros of this f, they will get close to each other. And in that case, the, uh, there is a simplification, uh, which is that the, this near horizon geometry will develop some long throat. So like, let me show a spatial, the spatial the slice of this geometry. So this is a picture, this is a drawing by Wheeler. I have modified it a bit here. I, I will uh, say what I mean by it later. Uh, but so the, the original picture is, uh, for instance, it uh, pictures this is this time, the rise the Nordstrom solution, the charged black hole solution. These lines that you see here, they are the field lines, the magnetic field lines, for instance, if you consider magnetically charged black hole. So you, they come out of one of the uh, one of the mouths and go in the other one. Uh, and as you see, it's a topological and non-trivial situation. So we have asymptotic Minkowski. So these are the asymptotic regions which are identified. And then we, uh, we have this uh, wormhole region. And uh, what happens when we go near extremality is that the lengths of this, uh, this wormhole become longer and longer. And the reason it helps is that when it becomes very long, you can for the physics inside the wormhole, you can uh, ignore what happens outside. You can reduce it to a simpler problem in which uh, effectively you get a two-dimensional theory instead of a four-dimensional theory. So the size of the, the sphere here is just a circle, but it should be, uh, this is really representing a, the sphere in higher dimensions. So that size of the sphere remains almost constant, and the whole dynamics is in happening in two dimensions. 
Now the idea is that you want to take this limit of having a long, long wormhole, and we want to implant a tunnel into a piece of this geometry. This is Schwarzschild de Sitte geometry. It has expanding regions and it has Schwarzschild singularities. Uh, so we want to cut this geometry. This also has the, the spatial topology of uh, R times S2 or interval times S2. So we want to cut it and then paste it in here. Uh, and if we manage to do that, then inside this wormhole, we get this inflating region. So this uh, solid line here, it, uh, uh, this uh, represents an, an expanding, uh, an expanding, ex uh, inflating uh, the space-time or the Sitter space-time. Uh, that then it's gonna be the or inflation. Uh, okay, so now uh, a bit more about the simplifications that happens in formulas. So what happens is that if we take this near extremal limit. Then the size of the, the sphere, so this part of the metric is the sphere, and R is the radius, or describes the area of the sphere. That size is almost constant. I take the constant to be one, plus a small fluctuations phi. And then there will be a two-dimensional part. And this two-dimensional part, if we are in the true vacuum, in the Minkowski vacuum, this two-dimensional part of the geometry becomes a a two-dimensional ADS onto the Sitter space. And if we are in the false vacuum, this two-dimensional part uh, becomes uh, the Sitter 2. And we can do a dimension reduction to get a simpler 2D model, which is called Jackie title bone gravity. So we have some matter fields. We have the 2D metric, and we have the phi, which discuss the fluctuations of the sphere. And basically, the question is to study the tunneling in this simpler setup. So all of this was to simplify the question, to get some uh, two-dimensional effective problem. So this is the two-dimensional setup that we study. Here I'm writing, again, the 2D matrix and the solution for phi, which was representing the size of the the area of the sphere, or the the size of the, if you like, the the uh, the, the size of the wormhole. And so this the first one is the, the anti the city metric that I talked about, written in Euclidean signature. I explain in a moment why Euclidean signature. And then the second one is the sitter, two dimensional, the sitter in Euclidean signature, which is actually just a sphere, two, two a sphere. And then there are the five solutions. So these five solutions are non trivial. If we, if we were exactly extreme, our phi would be zero. But we are just close to extrema, so phi is non-zero and has some change in profile. And we want to understand whether we can glue these two geometries together. And the gluing should happen by uh, via some excitation. So as as we had as as it was the case in the field theory example, in order to obtain it, we need to excite, we need to put in some energy. So here the idea is that we, we put some excitation in the middle and then we, we ask if that excitation can decay into this false vacuum bubble. That excitation here is modeled by a brain, a spherical symmetric brain which after I reduce it to 2D, it becomes just a single particle in 2D. So this is the red line. And this disk represents, or not disk, but this uh, region represents the, uh, the ADS2 region, Euclidean ADS2. 
and then we want this uh, this excitation to decay into the false vacuum bubble, which is the interior of this green curves. And the green curve is called the domain wall between the CTER and ADS region. Uh, these dotted lines have to be identified with the, with the red curve here. So now why do I consider Euclidean geometries? It's because it's the standard way of, uh, standard way of uh, investigating tunneling uh, semi-classically. We look for a Euclidean solution that, uh, that has a moment of uh, reflection symmetry. Here is the dotted line. And then if uh, then we cut this Euclidean solution at that moment and analytically continue it to the Lorentzian signature. Uh, so if we find this uh, Euclidean solutions with this moment of reflection reflection symmetry, that gives us the uh, that gives us a, that we that we call it a bounce solution, a tunneling solution that tells tells us about the possibility of this process to have this decay into uh, from excitation into the seed. Now, if we cut them and rotate them to Lorentzian signature, what we get in the first case is uh, just the Penrose diagram for ADS with the excitation in the middle. So this, uh, this region should be thought of as just representing the wormhole that I had before. These two sides should be thought of as the two mouths of the wormhole. So these two lines corresponds to these two, this uh, mouth and this mouth on the two sides of the geometry. Or here, if you want to look at it, it's like cutting this geometry at these two points. Uh, okay, so now this is the original solution that we start with. And now we want to uh, ask about tunneling to this other configuration in which we have the region of the sitter in the middle and there are the domain ones. So if we manage to find this solution, we have managed to find the tunnel into this configuration in which we indeed have this inflating region in the middle. So we have uh, this finding this solution, which means that, means that we have successfully glued the seater, uh, the false vacuum to the true vacuum. Uh, okay, so what, uh, what determines the motion of these brains and domain was that is essentially two equations there. It's just a continuity of phi and some jump condition that is determined by the tension or the mass of this excitation and the domain wall. And this phi, remember, is just the area of the, the area of the sphere that we suppress. Uh, so we are essentially solving this, these equations to get the full solution. Uh, so now I have a few slides to talk about the details of uh, this solution. Um, but I guess I can skip over most of the details. So we can just uh, consider various parts of that diagram and apply those equations find these solutions for instance the brain is gonna move on a geodesic uh, we will have the bifurcation point when the brain decays into the domain was where the this ads region in the true vacuum decays into the deceiver region in the false vacuum and here by energy momentum con conservation we get we basically fix the uh, this angle uh, or this break of the domain wall at the point. Uh, we can also talk, uh, I should also mention, say a few words about the underlying physics of this decay. So 
at the moment it was just a phenomenological model of some excitation decaying into the domain once. One can be a bit more concrete about it. Like in the field theory that, uh, that I'm considering, after I do a two-dimensional reduction, I can consider configurations that go from one vacuum to the other. This is called a kink and a configuration that goes back from that vacuum to this one called anti-kink. And a configuration that starts from here, goes there and comes back, which is called kink anti-kink configuration like this. Uh, now, this, this is basically what we are interested in, a bubble of false vacuum. This In this two-dimensional model, it becomes just a king counter king configuration. And we want to ask whether some we can have some excitation to decay into that. And the answer is that, yes, this is microscopically possible. It's microscopically possible to get this uh, this situation. For instance, the, if we consider the fundamental particle at the bottom of this well, it can decay uh, in the Euclidean signature, it can decay to that. It is much lighter than King and Iter King, which exactly means that when we go Euclidean, we can have uh, this diagram. Uh, which is kind of similar to the situation when we have, an, for instance, if you consider light axiom, uh, decaying that is coupled to E plus in minus, uh, this light axiom might be kinematically forbidden to decay into E plus in minus. That means that in Euclidean signature, it can, this diagram exist. And now if we put a strong electric fit, that process can actually materialize in Lorentzian signature. So what we are saying is basically a similar thing. A process that was forbidden in Lorentzian signature, once we turn on gravity, might become a law. And this is the process that we are conceived. Okay, so so we there is uh, there, we can uh, we can have a microscopic model, but uh, this is just one possibility. That it, there can be other possibilities for the for description of the brain and. Uh, and the brain decay. This was just as a proof of principle. Uh, the last thing to consider uh, to complete the solution is to consider the motion of the domain wall. And this domain wall basically follows the motion of a single particle in a potential. So it just goes back and forth in, in this effective potential. So one can find an effective potential. And then uh, there is a standard technology to go from here to the Lorentzian. We, uh, we rotate into Lorentzian signature at the point of time symmetry, as I mentioned before. And one can see from the shape of this potential that if we rotate it at the right point, then this domain was uh, guaranteed to fall into the black or singularities and leave us with this inflating reach. And then there, there is a choice of parameter that we can have for which this interior, the city region will be free uh, from any singularity. So the solution seems to exist. Now, once we have found this tunneling solution, the next thing to do is to ask about the probability of this tunneling event. And that probability is estimated by considering the difference of the action, the, uh, comparing two actions. One is the action for the, for the bond solution. And the other one is just the action for, uh, for the brain to move uh, in the geometry. So the initial, uh, initial situation in which there is no decay, just the brain, the red line moving along. So we can compare these two actions and what we get is that this difference is uh, of course large, which means that the probability of decay is exponentially suppressed as is expected for a tunneling event. However, it's not too small. And 
this is makes it promising because uh, we get the difference in the actions to be much less than the uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy of the black hole, which means that the probability of decay is much larger than one, one over the number of black hole microstates. So there is a decent chance for the process to happen. Uh, you should also talk about the embedding of this setup in four dimensions. So I mentioned about this wormhole that is necessary uh to begin with so one should ask can we even have such a wormhole and there are actually a couple of scenarios to create wormholes the older one is uh via uh, some analog of schwinger pair production so if you have some strong electric field for instance we can pair produced charged particle that is called the Schwinger effect. Similarly, if we have a we have very strong field, either electric or magnetic, we can pair produce black holes that are connected, charged black holes that are connected uh, in the interior, and that is essentially this geometry. There are also more recent works on traversable wormholes. So these wormholes that I'm that I've been talking about, they were non-traversable. They had the horizon. Uh, while these authors consider the situation in which if we have a uh, light matter field, uh, we might be able to make the, make the wormhole traversable. And uh, this setup is, First of all, it, it would be a scenario for creating a non-traversal wormhole because one can always put enough mass inside the traversal wormhole to turn it into the picture on the, law, on the left. However, a more interesting setup would be to actually do the tunneling or study the tunneling in the interior of this uh, traversable wormhole. And what is interesting about it is that one can think of an experimentalist who, who would go in the interior and does the experiment and create this inflating universe inside. So that would be a, a, a more uh, uh, a more literal uh implementation of what was asked in the, the paper by goose uh Farhi, Farhi goose and google okay so to summarize uh it is uh we we have a theory of inflation which is uh very successful but it would be interesting to ask about the origin of inflation or what came before inflation. Uh, and our solution suggests that there is, a, it is uh, possible to, uh, to have eternal Minkowski space to the past of inflation. Uh, it is possible to up tunnel and create inf uh, inflating regions from Minkowski. Uh, the bubble that we formed, the solution that we found, uh, was formed behind the horizon of a black hole. But as I mentioned, there are uh, there are setups in which one can study formation of this bubble, even. Uh, even in causal contact with the with the asymptotic observers, or which can be interpreted, it can be a more close interpretation of creating this uh, inflating region in a lab. Uh, and this is a work which is uh, which is very much in progress now. But uh, for now, I don't have any results to report. Uh, okay, thank you. I stop here. Okay. Thank you, Medad. It was very nice to see what you have done since the last time we met. So 
Let me see if we have any questions. We have a lot of compliments. Greeting about the presentation, but questions, let me see. So I have, I have, I have one question. Yes. Um, see, what we may characterize as uh, the physics of the, the city space time, how we can characterize the physics of the, the, the city? You got it? Uh, yes. So uh, I'm not sure if I understand the question. What do you mean by characterizing the physics? Uh, the, 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 how can I understand for a lay person what is the decita? Oh, well, it's uh, uh, what is the decita? Mm -hmm. Well, that is it's. Um, Well, actually, the city space time is something that we live in right now. So oh, the city course. is there. This is is what we see now. But, uh, however, I think that what what you would actually see in the city if if you live long enough, uh, unfortunately, or the city space time is uh, has a very very small expansion rate. It's like thirteen billion years. Of oh, one over thirteen billion years, so we won't get to see or experience much of this there. But, okay. But if we if we live long enough in the city, longer. So if we were to live much longer than thirteen billion years, or if we lived during inflation when the expansion rate was much higher and the time scale was much shorter, then what you would see as this in the city would be uh, like living in a thermal bath. You would see uh, you would see things fluctuating and everything is falling out of your horizon. So things would disappear from your uh, perspective. Like for instance, if we live long enough, we would see that galaxies go out of our horizon. As time passes, we see fewer and fewer things everything goes away and we would uh, uh, remain alone in the universe uh, but but on the other hand while everything falls through the horizon and escapes from your view you will see some fluctuations some thermal fluctuations that hit you at the temperature which is determined by the expansion rate so that is the that is the experience of living in this city. It's like living living in a thermal bath that is expelling everything from me. Okay, it's great. But in, in some points of your presentation, you talk about the uh, penhole singularity. Uh huh. Yes. The penhole singularity theorem. How yes. can I relate the penholes and the whole of your work? It's 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 a uh, it's very important to to achieve the solutions. Yes. So the so Penrose singularity theorem is very it's very powerful. It uh, it relies on very little amount of information. It basically uh, uh, requires just the re, just requires the null energy condition to be satisfied by matter physics. And once that is satisfied, and we get uh, we get we have inflating solution, then uh, we are guaranteed to have this singularity in the past, assuming uh, with some assumption about the spatial topology. Uh, so, what what I'm proposing here is that so okay so the important point is that Penrose singularity theorem is a classical theorem. It's about a okay. theorem in classical GR. So the way it is uh, avoided in this example is that I have a quantum mechanical tunneling. Uh, so quantum mechanics can go around Penrose singularity. In other words, I don't know if you can see my screen. 
But if you get my, if you look at my tunneling solution and extend it to the past, to the past of it, it does have a singularity. So it has a classical extension of my solution to the past satisfies this theorem. But it is obtained by a quantum mechanical tunneling, so its classical extension doesn't really exist. Okay. We have one question here. Uh, we are CSK. In your cosmological vision, what's the fate of the planet, the Earth planet, the end? Oh, the end. The of planet. The, what do you think is a cosmological guy, a scientist? What do you think about the fate, the of the planets, the Earth, and of the humanity, the human beings? It's oh. like so personal questions, not a scientific one. Uh -huh. I I mean I don't have any uh, I don't have any uh, any opinion about it. I don't know. I it's not it's not something that I have thought much about. Bem, Miracy, ele não não pensou muito sobre isso não. Na verdade, acho que ele pensa mais nas contas. Essas coisas filosóficas ele deixa para para outras pessoas perguntar. Bem, eu acho que so I think we have no more question. Okay. But but it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for for being here with us. Thank it was you. great. Thanks a lot. I hope you have a nice rest of the meeting. Okay, it will be great. See you. All right, bye. Bye. Bem, assim, eu sei que o tema não foi um tema muito outreach, né? Não foi muito de divulgação, mas eu acho que deu para a gente ter uma noção de que aqui algumas pessoas fazem a nível de cosmologia, nesse caso aí ele é teórico, né? Ele está trabalhando aí com teorias de gravitação quântica e coisas do gênero, então... Creio que nesse sentido foi uma contribuição interessante trazer aqui para o evento. Eu sei que mais tarde a gente tem mais uma, uma atividade, que eu acho que é a finalização. Não sei se o Eduardo já quer fazer logo isso por agora ou se a gente fica para o horário que estava marcado. Mas como não tem nada, então a gente fica por aqui. Então, por agora, mais tarde a gente volta para finalizar o evento. Espero que vocês tenham gostado aí da palestra do professor Merdade um pouco mais técnica do que as outras, mas a vida é assim mesmo, né? Às vezes a gente passa por coisas tão espinhosas que faz a gente aprender. Então, tá certo. Então, a gente fica por aqui. Agradeço a participação de vocês por hora. E mais tarde a gente vem para finalizar o evento. Obrigado e até breve.